Um, good morning or afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are. I'm Cody Eaton with JBS International. Um, thank you so much for joining today's Hope Navigator introductory webinar with Dr. Chan Helmuth. Before we begin, we'd like to review a couple housekeeping items. So all participants in the webinar will be muted for the duration of the presentation. However, we still wanna hear from you. If you have any questions or comments, please submit them using the chat feature. You can open your chat window by clicking on the chat icon located at the bottom center of your toolbar window. We will continuously monitor the chat throughout today's webinar, but presenters will address comments and questions at the end of the presentation. Um, the webinar is being recorded. The recording will be made available to the OVCTTA mailing list in the coming weeks. There will be a link to a post-event survey sent in the chat at the end of the presentation, as well as email to all registered participants in the coming days. We would greatly appreciate it if you filled it out as this will support future development efforts. If you experience any technical issues during the session, please message us using the chat feature or email us at obc-tta at jbsinternational.com. And now I'd like to turn things over to our presenter for today. Well, thank you very much, um, and it's a, it's a pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, my name is Chan Hillman, and I'm a professor at the University of Oklahoma. Um, I've been at the university for about 20 years. I'm a quantitative psychologist by training, um, and really what that means is that my PhD work is in statistics, research methods, and the philosophy of science. Uh, for my entire professional career, I've uh, partnered with community organizations, uh, primarily conducting outcome evaluations or impact studies, um, really evaluating the effectiveness of program services, uh, primarily in the areas of domestic violence, child maltreatment, homelessness, food insecurity, um, those kinds of, uh, of areas. And in a few moments, I'll share a PowerPoint slide and begin to talk about uh, the science of hope and its application. Um, I do not necessarily intend for this to be an academic presentation by any means. Um, I am going to basically use the presentation to summarize roughly 15 years of research and implementation um, that we've been doing uh, across the United States. Um, we actually have a multi-phase or multi-tiered training program um, where we are focused on working with organizations uh, to really create hope-centered organizational processes. And one of the things that I'd like to start off by highlighting is that for all of this work, um, our capacity to use hope as a framework is based on the idea that hope is not the outcome. Rather, hope is the process and well-being is always the outcome, whether for children, for adults, for families, for organizations or communities. Um, and so uh, at the end of all of this is going to be a little bit of a discussion about um, the Hope Navigator training uh, piece that we do offer, which is a two-day, 12-hour training. It's a deep dive and it's intended uh, to really empower individuals to begin to uh, develop strategic implementation plans to create hope-centered processes uh, within the organization. Those uh, hope navigators typically take on one of two areas of focus, um, and I'll talk about both of those later on, but um, there is a practice piece that is a, a client-facing uh, way in which to integrate hope-centered strategies. Uh, but there's also an internal or organizational piece where uh, really the focus is on um, using hope as a framework uh, to protect the workforce. Um, and we'll talk about issues around burnout, secondary traumatic stress, uh, et cetera. Um, in the state of Oklahoma, uh, two years ago, our governor declared that Oklahoma was going to become a hope-centered state. And what that meant for us is that we've been training 111 state agencies in Oklahoma, and we were also tasked to train 30,000 state employees. 
Um, and so we've roughly uh, covered about half of those organizations and state employees at, uh, at this point uh, and have uh, a lot of really powerful data uh, around those implications. Um, we've also expanded. Uh, we're now working with human service organizations in Iowa, Virginia, Washington, um, some in Nebraska, working towards uh, Delaware. Uh, and we just uh, entered into uh, a project in uh, Tennessee as well. So again, the uh, purpose of this particular webinar is going to be uh, really an introductory uh, piece to the science of hope with uh, really a ending discussion around that hope navigator process. Um, during the PowerPoint, I'm going to ask you to use the chat function um, throughout the presentation uh, to make it a little bit more interactive. Um, and I'll try to give you a little bit of a heads up um, as, uh, as I'm getting ready to ask you to engage in those processes. So with that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen uh, and begin uh, the presentation. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, this is the, the introductory phase of our multi-tiered system. We also do uh, hope awareness training for all staff uh, within an organization. Uh, we do have a leadership and executive leadership training uh, program, and then finally the HOPE Navigator uh, process. Um, in Oklahoma, our Oklahoma Department of Human Services was the first state agency uh, to engage in this multi-tiered system. We've been with them for roughly four years now, uh, showing significant gains uh, with, the, with our largest, largest state agency of 6,000 employees that serve about 1.5 million uh, Oklahomans. Um, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, get started. Um, and roughly 15 years ago, I was invited to an organization um, here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where I'm from. Uh, and this organization provides services to those living with HIV and AIDS. Um, as part of designing that housing needs assessment, I was really fortunate enough to get to meet uh, a couple of clients, really to focus on uh, what are the right questions to ask, uh, what are the right ways to ask those questions to really get at the heart of um, housing needs. And it was one of those conversations that lasted roughly five minutes uh, where I was introduced to this concept of hope. Um, and I was introduced to a young man named David. And David uh, at that time was 19 years old. And David shared with me that uh, three months earlier, he learned that he was HIV positive. Now, as a psychologist, what I will tell you is the first thing that came to my mind uh, was really this question. Given the adversity that David uh, was experiencing, uh, what must be those uh, adversities? What, what are some of the outcomes? What, are, what is being manifested as a response to those adversities? So I was really looking for, listening for depression, anxiety, emotional dysregulation. Um, and David further shared with me that roughly two weeks earlier, he had disclosed to his parents that he was HIV positive. They'd kicked him out of the house and he'd spent those last two weeks homeless in downtown Tulsa. Now, I'm starting to listen for not only depression and anxiety, but also now social isolation. And I'm starting to think about how David is navigating, um, you know, housing, nutrition, safety, uh, et cetera, uh, during this last uh, two week period. But it was, in, it was in that moment that David uh, shifted the conversation in a way uh, that changed my life both personally and professionally. In particular, David shared with me that uh, during this two week uh, period of being homeless, he had walked down to the local community college. He had made an appointment with an academic counselor. He actually came back uh, and met with that academic counselor declared a major and enrolled in that first semester of courses. 
And it was as David was sharing uh, with me this, this idea, um, it, it really began to strike me, this, this idea that during the midst of this adversity, David still was future oriented. He was still thinking about his future. And I began to think about uh, just basically the question of, you know, what are the strengths that David possessed um, that was really helping him navigate this adversity? Um, and then more importantly, what are the strengths that can be nurtured that can help children, adults, and families uh, navigate adversity um, to experience well-being? Um, and so I really started to shift the idea of the question, and that is, instead of being exclusively focused with what's wrong with you, um, I began to focus on this idea of the strengths orientation uh, based upon the question of what's right with you. So generally speaking, I like to, during this introductory phase, give a honor to the young man, David, who introduced me to this concept of hope. Now, one of the things that I uh, have spent my uh, career focused on is really looking at um, um, adversity and trauma. And so at the Hope Research Center and, and the work that we do here at the University of Oklahoma is really focused on three major questions. The first question is what is hope and why does it matter? What are the outcomes associated with nurturing hope? A more important question is how does trauma and adversity rob us of hope? And then the most important question that we're interested in is how do your program services nurture and restore that hope for children, for adults, and for families? So that really um, dominates the last 15 years of my life. So as a kind of foundation for that, I just, I don't wanna spend much time uh, focusing on things like the adverse childhood experience, but I just want to lay a little bit of a foundation uh, for this idea of hope-centered and trauma-informed. That is the, the focus and framework of, of this work. So my guess is um, most of you are familiar uh, with uh, the adverse childhood experience, um, uh, at least the original um, uh, ACE study via um, Folletti and Rob Anda. And so, as you know, the uh, adverse childhood experience is based upon these 10 categories of adversity that may have occurred before the age of uh, 18. Um, and it's just one of the more uh, recognized, more well-known frameworks for measuring uh, or assessing uh, levels of adversity. Um, and so one of the things that the Center for Disease Control does every few years is a nationally representative study to really examine the prevalence of the adverse childhood experience. And this is really just a refresher. You know all of, all of this already. And two of the big, really, really big takeaways from this research is first and foremost, is that uh, the exposure of adverse childhood experience is prevalent in our communities. Um, and as you can see, roughly two thirds of the adult population have experienced one or more of those adversities. And what we also know is that the dosage effect or the cumulative effect of those adversities um, have the power to um, uh, lead to a higher probability of uh, adversity, both physically, psychologically, and socially uh, across the lifespan. What I really wanna pay attention to in this slide is the at the very bottom, it shows the average uh, ACE uh, for uh, the population or for the sample that was studied from this latest study. This is about 70,000 adults across the United States. So on average, adults who participated reported just under two of those adversities. The reason I wanted to share that with you is because I wanna lay some of the foundation of where we're really doing hope work, where we're trying to uh, develop and test uh, hope strategies uh, that can nurture well-being in some very difficult spaces. So again, the national uh, average uh, for the adverse childhood experience, 1.61. Um, one of the things that I've been fortunate enough uh, over uh, several years uh, is to be one of the lead researchers 
um, looking at uh, children exposed to domestic violence. So this is a national study of roughly 3,000 uh, youth um, and uh, their report of exposure to the adverse childhood experience is significantly higher than the national average. And you can see uh, children exposed to domestic violence have on average uh, over four of those adversities. <clears throat> when we look at uh, some of the research we're doing uh, with parents who are system involved, uh, for instance, um, they also report high levels uh, of adversity. And some, this is some of our uh, more recent uh, work that we're doing in the child welfare system, um, working not only with youth, foster youth, uh, but biological and foster uh, parents as, as well. And then uh, this is actually the state of Oklahoma. Now, I'm going to ask you to use the chat function uh, uh, here in just a, a moment. But um, foster youth in Oklahoma, um, the Oklahoma Department of Human Services, uh, we are completely infused into our uh, child welfare system uh, with regards to uh, hope-centered strategies. And so this is foster youth between the ages of 14 and 17. And you can see that the average A score is significantly higher uh, than that national average. But what I'd like for you to uh, use the chat function and just uh, uh, what is your estimate of the average number of placements that a foster youth uh, might experience who is between the ages of 14 and 17? So what would you estimate is the average number of placements for that group of youth? And I'll just watch the chat function. So I'm not seeing any, any responses yet. Uh, I see. Okay, so it takes uh, a little bit more effort than uh, than usual. So um, just as you're thinking about this and uh, typing some of those in, um, our research with the foster youth um, in Oklahoma, who are between the ages of 14 and 17, the average number of placements uh, that they've experienced is 22. Uh, 22 um, different placements uh, for children between the ages of 14 and 17. So you can imagine then uh, that lack of consistency and uh, sort of its impact in addition to um, the other adverse childhood experiences that, uh, that they have um, been exposed to. Now, generally speaking, I'm not interested uh, in the adverse childhood experiences per se. I am much more interested in how it shows up. I am much more interested in how the exposure of trauma and adversity across the lifespan influence the way children, adults, and families engage in program services. Um, in particular, one of the things that we found, and this is some of our um, research, so if you look in the upper left-hand corner, um, you can see that what we found is that uh, adults who report an A score of one or higher report significantly lower levels of trust in professionals. So what I can be more blunt about is that they report significantly lower levels of trust in you. And so if they do not experience that level of trust, what I'm interested in is how does that influence the way they engage in programs? If I don't trust you, how does that influence the way that I communicate with you? How does that influence the way that I engage in help seeking or health seeking behaviors? So we've published research that shows that adverse childhood experiences lead to significantly higher rates of rumination, which lead to lower levels of hope. Uh, we've also uh, found that higher rates of adversity lead to uh, post-traumatic stress, as well as higher rates of anxiety that also reduce um, um, our capacity for hope. Um, and then finally, one of our studies uh, that we published recently demonstrates that adverse childhood experience leads to insecure adult attachments, which leads to lower hope. 
And the reason I like to highlight that particular published research um, is that our sample is not uh, families, it's not uh, parents who are engaged in the system or youth. This was a national study of judges and attorneys and law enforcement. Um, so I'm just much more interested in how trauma shows up. And so one of the things that we continue to hear as we um, are, have been involved in the trauma-informed, trauma-aware movement is that as we begin to create a community awareness around things like the adverse childhood experience, a common theme that we hear is, uh, is this, that is, um, what do we do about the adverse child? What do we do about adversity and trauma that children, adults, and families are experiencing? And the whole purpose of this presentation and ultimately the Hope Navigator is that hope. Hope is the framework for action. Um, hope provides that framework that helps us guide behaviors uh, to, uh, to respond to things like the adverse childhood experience. So that's really been the foundation of the curriculum that we have uh, developed. So now I'm gonna um, get into this conversation about hope. So it looks like the chat function um, should be uh, fixed if I'm reading that correctly. So what I'd like to do before I provide you the definition um, is just to, to ask, when you think about this word hope, um, what comes to mind? What do you associate uh, the word hope with? Uh, and again, if you don't mind just uh, type those um, ideas into the, to the chat function. <laughs> Very good, thank you, Megan. So optimistic about the future, very good. Yeah, that's a very, very common response. And we'll see if uh, some others pop up um, as, as we move forward. So let me, let me ask an additional question. Do you think that hope is a feeling? Is it an emotion that we have? Um, or is hope a way of thinking? And thank you all for typing into the chat. I, I do greatly appreciate that. So do you think hope is a feeling uh, that we have or is hope a uh, cognitive process? Is hope a way of thinking? Okay, thank you. Thank you, there's a feeling. And chances are somebody's thinking or typing both. Um, yeah, there you go, thank you, Julie. Um, so it's really important for us to recognize that hope uh, is a cognitive process, that hope is a way of thinking. And so let's think about this for a moment. If hope was a feeling, if hope was an emotion, then at best we'd be able to help children, adults, and families uh, manage those feelings. But because hope is a cognitive process, that is, because hope is a way of thinking, we know it's something that we can teach. We know um, that hope can be taught across that lifespan. So the definition is that hope is the belief that the future will be better than today and that we have the power to make it so. So if we look at this definition and we say hope is the belief that the future will be better than today, if we stop there, that really is optimism. That's an optimistic expectation of the future. But hope goes beyond optimism by including this latter part of the definition. That is that we have the power to make it so. So in this way, hope is about taking action to pursue that future. Now, one of the things that I really love about the concept of hope is that it's, it's a very simple concept. It's very simple to understand. And it's made up of three simple ideas of goals, pathways, and willpower. Now, goals are the cornerstone of everything that we do around hope. Everything starts with goal setting. And it's based upon this idea that all purposeful behavior is goal directed. That is from the moment you wake up until the moment you go to bed, we are all pursuing goals in our life, whether in the short term or the long term. So the question with hope is whether or not we have the ability to identify the roadmaps or the strategies by which to pursue those goals. Pathways thinking is the ability to strategize how we're going to get there from here. 
pathways thinking is also our ability to identify barriers or potential barriers and to engage in the problem solving process to either overcome those barriers or to find alternative pathways. So that's pathways thinking. Willpower is really the ability to focus and to sustain your mental energy onto those pathway pursuits. So willpower is really the ability to focus your attention and intention on pathway pursuits. Uh, now, the common term in psychology is agency, to be agentic. Um, but because we work with so many different agencies, um, I prefer to use the word willpower. It's a little easier uh, for us to remember, um, and it doesn't really confuse whether we're talking about the organization uh, or this psychological process. So goals, pathways, and willpower. Now, when I first started thinking about hope and started thinking about what David um, was helping me to understand in his, his conversation um, was this idea that both pathways and willpower are required uh, to be hopeful. So when I came back to my office here uh, on campus, and you can see behind me, I have a, a real chalkboard. So when I came back, I actually drew this um, onto my chalkboard. And I started to think about this, uh, this idea of hope um, and two things occurred to me. So I, I really have two challenges for you um, to really start off this conversation of hope. And the first thing that I started to think about was if, if hope is really about goals, pathways and willpower, then it dawned on me that hope, the language of hope is one of the best descriptors I've ever seen of what is going on in our communities, that our human service nonprofit organization, our community partners, are pathways of hope for the children, adults, and families that they serve. So the first thing that I started to think about was how I think the language of hope is the best description of the work you do, that your staff are pathways of hope for uh, the families uh, and individuals that they serve. Teachers are pathways of hope for children. The second thing uh, that occurred to me was that this idea of hope being based upon goals, pathways, and willpower uh, was a little different way of thinking about hope than I was used to. So if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you just to type into the chat function again. What are some common phrases uh, that we use with each other uh, where we use the word hope. So when you're just passing by with somebody and you use the word hope in a common phrase, what, what might be some of those common uh, phrases that you would use? Yeah, very good. Oh, I love that. Very good. Thank you all so much for, uh, for doing that. I hope it doesn't rain. Um, so I'm from Oklahoma, uh, and Stacy knows that, but I'm from Oklahoma, and one of the things that we commonly will say is, I hope there are no tornadoes today. And so when I think about that statement, I hope that there are no tornadoes today, when there are thunderstorms in our area, um, my goal is that I don't want there to be any tornadic activity. My willpower becomes very high. I'm highly energized and focused on that. The problem is, is that I have absolutely no control over the weather. That is, I have no pathways. And so one of the things that occurred to me is that we have to understand the distinction between hoping and wishing. Because wishing is when we have a desire, when we have that mental energy towards something, but we have no strategies, we have no pathways. So that's actually the definition of a wish. And to understand the distinction between hoping and wishing, wishing is passive towards the goal. Hope is about taking action to pursue that goal. Now, this is a really critical takeaway in all of our conversations around the science of hope, because as you begin to talk to people, for instance, outside of this webinar, and you know, maybe share with them that you uh, attended a hope webinar today, what we have to understand and remember is that when you use the word hope, 
most everybody else is interpreting that as a wish. They're, they're saying or thinking to themselves that you've attended a wishing uh, webinar. So we have to be really intentional in our language of goals, pathways, and willpower. <clears throat> now, one of the things that um, I've been really uh, interested in is trying to understand how adversity and trauma not only rob us of hope, but how does it influence the way we think about goals, the way we consider pathways, and how does it impact um, our mental energy to engage in those pathway pursuits? This very first uh, bullet is probably one of the most profound discoveries that we've made, and we've replicated it um, dozens of times uh, across many different um, human service nonprofit organizations. And basically what we discover is that when you and I are experiencing adversity, we are much more likely to set avoidant goals. That is, we're much more likely to think about outcomes or goals that we do not want to occur. But when we're able to nurture and restore hope, what we see is a transi transition from avoidant goal setting to an achievement mindset. So let me give you a really quick example of uh, that avoidant mindset. So imagine a basketball player who steps out on the court and the mindset is, I wanna get the ball and shoot the winning shot for my team. That is an achievement mindset. But if I'm that same basketball player and I step out on the court and my mindset is, I hope they don't throw me the ball because I'm probably gonna lose it and really disappoint my team. That's an avoidant mindset. The critical piece is to imagine how those two players behave on the court. And what I want you to understand is that the nature of the goals that we set drive our pathways thinking. And so that if we've got programs that are based upon an avoidant framework, so let's think about drug court, for instance, and what is the common message in, in some drug courts, not all of them, um, but, but some of that policy, some of that practice, some of that conversation is centered around the idea that if you do drugs, you will go to prison. So it's an avoidant type of culture. So we have to begin to think about uh, the very nature of our goals. One of the things uh, that I've been studying with uh, um, uh, my interest in homelessness um, is what we find is that short-term goal setting is a much stronger predictor of outcomes than long-term goal setting. So short-term goal setting, that is maybe uh, day uh, intervals or week intervals become stronger predictors of outcomes than those long-term kind of ambiguous goals. We also know that during times of adversity, pathways thinking becomes strained. Uh, sometimes it becomes strained by urgency, um, the chaos that's associated with uh, trauma and adversity. It makes it hard to think about how to get there from here. Uh, what we find in our research is that um, children who have uh, exposure to adversities really struggle with the pathways uh, component. And then finally, willpower, um, is uh, really drained by fear and rumination. One of the things that the research shows very consistently is that our willpower, your willpower and my willpower is a limited resource. That is willpower is finite. And during the course of the day, we are all draining our willpower. So when you go home at the end of the day, emotionally exhausted or mentally exhausted, that's what I'm talking about, that depletion of that willpower. The problem is, is that willpower is strongly associated with self-regulation or self-control. So that when our willpower drops, when our willpower is depleted, that our capacity to control our thoughts, emotions, and behaviors become much more difficult. And so the final piece of this research that I find really fascinating uh, is the suggestion that our willpower is associated with the glucose in our system. And so, as you know, glucose for us is not only sugar, it is our source of energy. And so when our glucose levels deplete, so too does that willpower. And what this highlights is the importance of nutrition. 
So nutrition becomes a very important component uh, of nurturing hope in programs. So think about free and reduced lunches at schools or community eligibility programs or making sure that we have nutrition programs for foster youth or you know, juvenile um, in, involved uh, youth, for instance. All right, so uh, I'm going to try this with uh, with the chat function. So I really want to give you a heads up that I'm I'm going to ask you to engage here. Um, this is probably one of the more important slides in this presentation, um, and so I just really want to want to give you a chance to to participate in this if you can. Uh, if you can't, it's okay. I can I can navigate through it. But I want to show you um, through a hypothetical example the way that goals, pathways, and willpower um, all intersect uh, around this concept of hope. So what I'd like to do is ask you to just to type into the chat function, how many of you know how or have ever attempted to drive a manual transmission vehicle? So how many of you have had that uh, wonderful experience? Very good. <laughs> Seems like most have, I think Megan said never. Very good, very good. Great, so for those of you who've had this wonderful experience, what I'd like for you to do is to remember that very first time. What I'd like for you to do is remember kind of the anxiety, the excitement, the fear, all of those things that you were feeling about uh, this, this kind of uh, uh, first experience of driving a manual transmission vehicle. Now, all of us can participate in this, even Megan or anybody else who has not uh, had the opportunity to drive. It's a hypothetical example, and chances are you, you've you seen uh, in movies or in other people drive a manual transmission vehicle, so you know, um, you know that it's kind of this hand-eye coordination uh, hand foot eye coordination. Um, so in this hypothetical example, the goal is that you want to drive. And so the only pathway that is available to you is a manual transmission vehicle. So if you're going to achieve your goal of driving a vehicle, you have to learn how to do this manual transmission vehicle. So let me ask another question. I'll ask you to use the chat function. Um, so uh, just in your mind, can you picture the vehicle that has the manual transmission? Can you see it in your, in your mind? Uh, can you picture the pedals uh, on the floor, the gearbox or the stick shift that's off to the side? Can you imagine yourself sitting in the driver's seat uh, of that vehicle? And then ultimately, can you just imagine yourself driving? Uh, in this hypothetical example, can you just see yourself moving forward in this vehicle? And this is one of our six guiding principles of hope that the, that the hope navigators will get a deeper dive into. But the guiding principle is that imagination is the instrument of hope. And what I mean by that it is that it's one thing to set a goal about the future, but if we really want to nurture willpower and pathways thinking, then we have to cast a vision of what future success is going to be like. And more importantly, we have to help the individual or the family see themselves in that future, and that will elevate that willpower piece. Okay, so you're gonna drive this manual transmission vehicle for the very first time, but I'm going to add in two small pieces of adversity. First and foremost, you're parked facing uphill, uh, a steep incline, so that when you let that clutch out, you have to go up a, a hill. And then the second piece of adversity is there's a brand new BMW parked immediately behind you. So, okay, you're gonna do this uh, hypothetical example of driving this vehicle for the very first time. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to use the chat function again. Um, but let's say that you've got the car started, you're in first gear, um, and you're getting ready to let that clutch out. Now, remember, you're going uphill, and you've got a brand new BMW parked immediately behind you. So in that moment that you're starting to let that clutch out, in that moment, what is your goal? And if you don't mind, if you can, just type that into the, the chat function. <laughs> to stop crying, very good. 
Yeah, to move forward, not backwards. Very good. To not slide backwards, hit the gas. Yeah, so what I want to highlight, though, is that many of these comments to not slide backwards, to not hit the BMW, um, these are avoidant goals. These, uh, and, and what I want to highlight is that it is natural for us whenever we're in an adverse situation to go to that avoidant uh, space. Now, not hitting the BMW is a good goal. So I first and foremost want us to recognize that not hitting the BMW, that avoidant goal, is a good goal. The problem is, is where it comes from, and it comes from fear and an uncertainty. So we don't want to stay there. We want to be able to navigate through that. So just as a recognition that it is common and natural for us to set that avoidant goal. So let's say in this process, you let the clutch out, you didn't hit the BMW, but you killed the engine. So if you can imagine what you were saying to yourself that first time that you stalled the engine when you drove, you know, something like, I can't do this, I'll never be able to do this. And what we see is that this is the self-talk of a lower hope scenario. So when we see um, hope scores lower, um, the individuals are typically focused on failure um, and really coming at these new goals and pathways uh, with a focus on failure and real agitation uh, associated with that. Now, one of the questions that I would ask if we were all in person is a conversation about, for those of us who killed the engine, why didn't we quit? Why didn't we um, just quit and give up uh, when, we, when we failed? And typically the reason is because we want to drive. We want and desire that goal. And this is a really critical takeaway. And that is it's, it's important for us to remember that it's their goals, not our goals for them. That is the goal has to be theirs and desired. So let's say that you start the car back up, you let the clutch out, and this time you lurch forward. You're moving forward up the hills. You're successful. And so because practice makes perfect, you're going to pull over, turn the car off and start all over. But this time when you let the clutch out, you killed the engine again. But I want us to think about what's going through our mind now uh, as we experience this failure. And typically what I hear is things like, well, I've done it before. I can do it again. And this is another one of our guiding principles that's based upon the idea that hope begets hope right? That hope begets hope. That is this one opportunity for success showed us the future is possible. Even if it was luck, the future is possible. And so it becomes a critical point as we begin to build and nurture hope-centered programs is that we have to build these moments of early success so that people begin to see that it is possible. And then pretty soon you learn how to navigate um, letting the clutch out of the car, and pretty soon um, you've, you've kind of got that most, most of the time. So this is the pathways component. So the question becomes, how well can you manage the willpower? How well can you manage your mental energy? So just think about how much of your focus is required the first time you let the clutch out, and the answer is all of it. And then think about how much of your willpower is required today when you're driving. And the answer is eh, not, not a whole lot unless something happens. And so if you could at least entertain the idea that goals, pathways, and willpower has the potential to be a descriptor of your program services, then it has really significant implications on how we design the way that clients move through program services because we have to remember that willpower is limited and that our clients uh, and individuals that we're working with are going through tremendous adversities that are detracting their ability to focus their attention. And so if they have these detractors, uh, these significant detractors around housing, safety, uh, et cetera, the ability to focus on complex pathways become very, very difficult. So we have to be very intentional in our design of programming. All right, so I'm gonna ask you to use the chat function again. Um, and I, this is a question I like to ask at almost every presentation I give, and that is, uh, what is the opposite of hope? 
When you think about this concept of hope, what do you imagine the opposite of hope being? Very good, Megan, very good. Right, good job. So despair is probably the most common response uh, that we get. Um, despair uh, universally, by the way, is, is the most common response. But what we know is that the loss of hope is actually a process. Um, when, our goal, when our goals are initially blocked, we can experience anger, frustration, anxiety. If we're unable to overcome those barriers to the goals that we desire, we can transition into despair. But with despair, we still have willpower. We still have a lot of mental energy and focus on that thing that I cannot have. Now, despair um, can be kind of a dangerous space because in despair, I still have the willpower towards the goal and I may transition into desperation. That is grabbing a hold of pathways that may be dysfunctional to myself uh, or others uh, around me. And so with despair is also this sense of urgency that um, whatever is going to happen has to happen right now. And then as Megan said, this idea that apathy is the opposite of hope. So apathy is when I give up. That is, I look at a particular goal or a pathway and my mindset is no matter what I do, I'm gonna fail, so why try? Now, what I will tell you is that these two spaces, despair and apathy, these are the most interesting to me with regards to how do we create hope-centered strategies to begin moving the needle while we're working with someone who may be apathetic, for instance. <clears throat> now, the data is pretty clear on the relationship between things like hope and depression. So here, with our uh, HOPE assessment, which by the way is an eight item self-report measure, it takes about five minutes to administer and score. But we can categorize the responses into low, slight, moderate, and high. So here we can see that uh, individuals who report low HOPE, uh, just under 70% of them report depression. And so you can see that as the higher rates of HOPE um, emerge lower levels of depression. Uh, very similar pattern for suicidal uh, ideation. Um, and we've published a couple of papers um, in this space, not just uh, ideation, but actual attempts uh, as, as well. The good news is we know how to teach hope. The good news is, is that hope is something that can be taught. And within our curriculum that we've developed, we can see a statistically significant increase in hope in about one hour. In about one hour's worth of focused work, we've seen significant improvements in some really difficult scenarios. The question becomes, can we sustain that hope? And that is really where the hope navigators uh, come into play. So just as the loss of hope is a process, so too is the capacity to nurture hope. Remember, um, goals are the cornerstone. It always starts uh, in, in that process of identifying what the desirable goals are, finding those viable pathways. And then I'm just a big fan of this idea of creating future memories of success. That is that imagination is the instrument of hope uh, piece. Uh, real quickly, I'll show you uh, some data with some uh, high um, adverse childhood experience youth. Um, this is a, a group of youth. This is a, the reason I want to show you some of this data uh, is that this is a non-therapeutic intervention. Um, this is where we trained uh, camp counselors uh, from a YMCA type camp uh, to really work with youth on setting goals and finding pathways. And in particular, this uh, was targeted towards youth who have a high experience of adversity. Uh, in, in their lives. So we measured hope roughly 30 days before the intervention, the week-long intervention. Uh, we measured the youth's hope score at the last day of uh, the, the summer camp, and then a 30-day follow-up. And so what you can see is a significant increase in, in these children's hope scores. Uh, the reason I wanted to show you this is uh, two things. 
Uh, first and foremost, if you look at the pretest scores, this is the slight hope category. Uh, on average, 25.38 represents slight hope scores. So this is high depression, high anger, high suicidal ideation. And that at the end of one week, we saw a significant increase in those children's hope scores. So the first big takeaway is that what I want you to see is that this two point increase in a, children, a child's hope score actually predicted a letter grade change in the classroom. Remember, hope is not the outcome. Hope is the process. And as many of you know, a child going from a D average to a C average is a game changer in their life. But perhaps more importantly, what I want you to see is that the one week intervention did not solve the problem. We didn't go from slight hope to high hope. The intervention moved the needle. It literally moved the needle to slightly higher hope. And it had such profound outcomes such as um, academic uh, outcomes. There were a whole host of other uh, parent-child relationships, uh, a whole host of other outcomes that we tracked. So we know how to do this. We know how to nurture hope. Um, and we train the hope navigators uh, through this process. It's a two-day, um, um, very intensive four-session um, training program. So these hope navigators come in and uh, at the end of the training, they walk away with in their hands a strategic implementation plan of what are those next steps and how do they integrate it into um, their um, program services. I'm actually going to go ahead and uh, stop. I think we've got about 10, a little less than 10 minutes uh, to go. Um, I've trained a little over 2,500 HOPE navigators um, across the United States, uh, whether that's an education program, state agencies, um, um, community partners. Uh, I've done it in substance abuse and recovery, domestic violence, um, departments of transportation. Um, with Stacy, we're working with law enforcement. So um, we're just seeing some really profound and amazing uh, outcomes. Now, with regards to the impact on staff, what I want to say is that what we see is a when, when we do uh, train people on how to do uh, hope, what we see is a significant reduction in burnout. We also see a significant reduction in secondary traumatic stress. And in the Department of Human uh, Services uh, here in Oklahoma, we actually saw a three-year trend of increasing HOPE scores among staff across the whole agency. And this year, the cabinet secretary reported a 17% reduction in turnover on staff. Uh, for the state of Oklahoma, that's millions of dollars um, in saved uh, cost for recruitment, selection, training, uh, et cetera. And really our framework here is that we have to protect those who are serving others. So that's really where we start um, with our training focus. So I think with that, um, I'd, I'd love to give a little bit of time and space to some Q and A. Um, I actually went a little longer than I thought I would. So I apologize for that. So if you, if you can just use the chat function, if there are is a question. If there's not, that's fine. <clears throat> and I guess I would also highlight that um, there will be a scheduled what uh, I think what it's referred to as a happy hour. And this is really um, a reserved space of time for some Q&A to learn a little bit more about the HOPE Navigator training, uh, more into the details of um, what that implementation um, process would look like. And so we can certainly use that space as well. Oh, not happy hour, <laughs> office hour.
Yeah, so uh, Carlos, um, curious uh, if I could speak more to the details about how this has been used in uh, domestic violence or other victim uh, service areas. Um, sure, so one of the first things that I started to pay attention with domestic violence or victim services um, is how um, our organization systems um, tend to have outcomes that are of focus. So for instance, in domestic violence, that may be looking at uh, service uh, safety plans or uh, protective orders that were um, awarded or, or granted. Um, but one of the things that we wanted to do with this idea of hope-centered programming is to really give space to asking the clients, uh, the, the survivors, what are, uh, what are goals that they have during the process? So the whole idea is to really uh, allow for um, a client goal participation uh, and not just a recipient of the goals that the systems have. Um, so in that particular space, we gathered over 500 goal statements of which 10% um, had, um, only 10% had anything to do with safety. Um, and so what we saw is that when we uh, saw increases in uh, hope scores among survivors, they actually saw uh, reported significantly higher rates of goal attainments uh, that they set. Um, so that's one space. Uh, I'm also pretty involved in our Department of Corrections um, and our juvenile affairs and some other programming. Um, so let me just stop there and see if there are other um, Yeah, so Stacy has a question about uh, uh, non-victim service areas. Um, so I just trained um, Coca-Cola Bottling Company. I am working with uh, uh, several insurance companies. Um, uh, Aetna in particular is, uh, is a particular partner uh, where we're going to be working with uh, not only the within the organization, but also in their care managers to really look at continuum of care and hope-centered strategies uh, to look at health outcomes. Um, yeah, absolutely. In school systems, we see significant reductions in chronic absenteeism, a truancy, significantly uh, higher uh, grades, higher graduation rates. Um, HOPE actually is a better predictor of first-year college performance than the ACT, SAT, or high school GPA. Um, so we're really across all of the sectors in our community with very similar outcomes. And what we know is that HOPE is one of the strongest predictors of well-being. And, and that's true across um, uh, medicine, mental health, uh, criminal justice, uh, school systems, the workplace, um, et cetera. So I think we're just about out of time. Um, yeah, we. I have a few housekeeping items to do. Um, thank you so much. This was excellent. So we would, uh, I sent a few of the resources um, in the chat uh, for, uh, for Meg, to answer Megan's question, additional Hope Navigator resources. Additionally, we'd greatly appreciate it if everyone filled out the survey I just sent in the chat. Um, it'll help with future development efforts. Um, the presentation recording will be distributed to the OVCTTA mailing list in the coming weeks. Um, as a reminder, there is the Hope Navigator Office Hour, uh, which we plan on it being more of a Q&A session concerning Hope Science and the Hope Navigator training, uh, which the Hope Navigator training is planned to be in late September, and the Hope Navigator Office Hour will be on Thursday, August 24th, 2023, from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Additional emails will be sent out to remind people on the OVCTTA li uh, mailing list. Uh, please stay tuned for future webinar announcements. And if you have any questions or comments, feel free to reach out to us at obc-tta at jbsinternational.com. So yeah, thank you so much and hope everyone has a great rest of the week. <laughs>